Rest in peace, Betty White. We only own one of the shirts, but you can be assured I do have my Golden Girls socks on today in honor. everybody and welcome back to my channel. I am Jen, this is James, and this is Fundy Fridays. And here on this channel we talk about different aspects of Christian fundamentalism. Sometimes I do my makeup, sometimes he vapes really loudly on camera, but most of the time <laughs> we are talking about the bad parts about fundamentalism. Notice I didn't say good parts. And today we are catching up with the Plath family. This is the third special I've made about the Plath family. Today we are talking about the third season of their show. The Plath family are a quiverful family from Georgia. Quiverful means that they leave their family size up to God, up to and including not using any type of chemical or natural birth control. They are most of the time very strict conservative Christians. They can be Protestant or Catholic, doesn't matter. All that matters is that you have a lot of children and you, you know, build an army for Christ to go to the polls and usher in a Christian theocracy. But we don't have time to talk about that today. We're going to be talking about the Plath family and all of the drama and politics that exist just within their own family. And with these Quiverful families, there's just so many of them that there's bound to be conflict. And, um, conflict they do. I will say for the record, I left my vape in the other room. I did not realize it picked up on camera as much as it did. I thought I was being sneaky sneaky. Yeah, just, uh, the third installment in, uh, exploring the autopsy of this family <laughs> yeah. as it's ripped open in front of the world. Within the Plath family and in the show, there is a lot of of lots of different types of trauma and abuse and communication styles and boundaries and lack thereof and parentification and um, spiritual abuse and uh, enmeshment. Shout out Mickey Atkins. This family has dubious connections to notorious child abusers, the Pearls of No Greater Joy Ministries. And they're also, and I don't know how close they are to the Rodriguez family, but the Rodriguez family seems to be obsessed with the Plath family. But several of the kids are friends. Uh, they've been to each other's weddings. When you have such strict and more importantly, specific beliefs that Quiverful and Independent Fundamental Baptists have, you know, the amount of friends that you can have is very limited. I would describe the relationship between the Rodriguez family and the Plath family as not fully, but predominantly one-sided. Um, I feel like in the post you'll see that the uh, the Rodriguez family is much more excited to see the Platts than the other way around. I would I say, could be misjudging. Let me say for the record, I could be misjudging. Is it fair to say that Jill is doing to Kim what Kim is doing to the rest of her family? <laughs> If you don't know who the Pearls are, if you don't know who the Duggars are, please look all this shit up. Man, I just, I hate to say it, but this is a, this is like a third year level course that we're in right now. You need to have taken the prerequisites, so go ahead and check those out before you come back. And for the record, I do want to say, though, specifically in regards to the Plaths, um, if you haven't watched this show, and I mean beginning to end... Go ahead and do it. It is uncomfortable at times. It is really um, triggering, but it is incredible because at least the people that aren't living with Kim are doing great um, things and they're changing and learning and, and growing as people. That's and I, fun to see. And I think that for everybody here in the Fundy Fridays community uh, who is interested in religious deconstruction, which would seem to be most of us, uh, this as far as I've seen, is the best portrayal of modern American evangelical religious deconstruction that we have in media. I haven't seen a documentary or um, really anything else that so clearly portrays the, the struggles of the deconstruction process, the real human effects that conservative uh, Christianity and Quiverful and this style of parenting have on people and how they have to process it as they move out into the world and move on with their lives. So I'm not going to pretend like Jen said, I'm not going to pretend it's always easy to watch. A content warning over the entire show for anyone who's deconstructing themselves because you're probably going to see some stuff that's uncomfortable, but you're going to see even more stuff that's really life affirming and, and reassuring of your own journey. So a great show, I think. Something that I really like about the Plath show, especially, um, <laughs> this third season is that they are showing what happens after you leave an abusive or traumatic situation because it doesn't get better immediately and you have to put in work 
like and it shows the the really hard and difficult work of going through this process most stories of deconstruction tend to kind of give you the great awakening and then the immediate aftermath but this is long term we're seeing people struggle for more than a year um, we're seeing long-term ramifications of, of this lifestyle and this, um, mm -hmm. this, this faith on people's relationships and their ability to form intimate connections with others. You just don't get to see that. And I think that for a lot of you all, again, we've talked about who are in the process of deconstruction. I think those other types of media kind of do you a disservice. Like they're, they're showing you the beginning and then you're stuck to live the rest of your life yeah. and, and go, now what? Well, welcome to Plathville. It's it's a little glimpse into what now what means for someone who just stepped a little bit farther away from their faith or is challenging some of the ways that they were brought up. I don't want to speak as someone who has gone through religious deconstruction because I really haven't, but from the folks I've spoken to, um, both in my personal life and through all of you, um, it just seems like something that might at times be very soothing. Um, and very, I know I just keep saying life affirming, but you need your life affirmed. Let's affirm lives. You don't see Olivia and Ethan going to therapy, but you see how they use the tools and skills that they've learned in therapy in real life. Yes, you do see them have their sit down individual interviews where they talk about, you know, their true feelings on the subject, but then it also shows them interacting with their family. Like Mariah still goes and sees Kim all the time. That's important because your life doesn't stop once you um, leave the family. You know, you still have to go on. You still have to go to Christmas. The spiritual abuse and the just the narcissistic abuse that this family specifically went through and just the entire uh, trauma that comes with living under purity culture, the extreme um, child rearing and corporal punishment that comes with fundamentalism, that affects every single aspect of somebody's life top to bottom. And it's going to affect their relationships. It's going to affect their job, their hobbies, their friendships, everything. And it really shows holistically what it does to a person on this show. That's the only good thing that I will say about this show. I, I like that they show the aftermath of leaving a bad situation, the deconstruction and family politics of Quiverful, because you never see conflict on these, um, religious programs on TLC. Well, Sister Wives, but that's a, that's like its own genre. You usually never see conflict, um, like on the Duggar show or the Bates show or any of these huge families because that's not what the show's about. And this one dives straight into it. And part of that is because of Kim's narcissistic behaviors is that she would probably let you film anything as long as it's about her. The bad thing about the show is this, I just think it is still at the end of the day, it is exploitative reality TV. The producers, I don't think that they would like, be like, now Kim, I saw how you spoke to Lydia and I don't, I don't think that was very nice. Like, I know they're not gonna say that. I think that it's kind of fucked up to let, um, let things just be portrayed that the way that they are and to give in to um, Kim's wishes, but. So trigger warning, narcissistic abuse, emotional, spiritual, religious, I would argue financial as well. It's really not that bad, I'll say. Not to, not, I don't want to diminish anybody's traumas. I'm just, we're not going to show anything graphic. Turn it off if you need to, but you can probably handle it. And I think you'll enjoy what we've got to say. Season three opens up. It's, you know, just a recap of last season. Um, what happened last season? Mariah and Micah were kicked out of the house. And Kim would like you to believe that uh, it was mutual, even though they were minors. Yeah. Um, Micah's a hotshot, sexy model. Mariah's a singer. Ethan's a mechanic. Olivia's a photographer. Olivia, hit me up. Needs wedding photos. Mm -hmm. Kim, I don't know if they're still doing the Airbnb at the old place, but they have moved into a house across the street from Olivia and Ethan, which is totally not on purpose. And it appears that Ethan and Olivia have gone no contact with the rest of the family, and Mariah and Micah are playing the fence there. Uh, I just made that phrase up. But they're trying to keep it civil, and that's that's reasonable. I mean, I don't know. At the end of the day, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? I think it also kind of shows, uh, or and this is a fit fan theory of mine, but I think it also shows that there may have been some differences in the treatment these kids received while they were at home. Absolutely. I can't help but feel, and you'll see this throughout the season, Ethan just as angry as ever. Um, whereas 
Micah, as you're seeing on screen here, uh, has a lot of reasons to really not care about what's going on. He's got plenty going on. And Mariah is the you know, one who seems to be trying to play the middle ground between the rebellious side of the, the children and the... the um, agreeable side of the children i guess i would say so we're not mm -hmm. diagnosing yeah. anybody with anything we're not saying that kim has narcissistic personality disorder what we're saying is that as a mother and as a person she has done some very sh narcissistic and shitty things to these kids while we won't diagnose her with narcissistic personality disorder we will point out narcissistic actions and behaviors of hers and as you watch this show and series there is no shortage Oh, Let yeah. us tell you. <laughs> yeah, she can't go more than five minutes without doing something. And it's whenever she's on screen. I swear you watch this show and it becomes a Pavlovian trigger. You see Kim on screen and you just lose a little bit of energy. So what we'll say is that we know there's uh, online, especially a uh, growing discourse right now around narcissistic parenting and uh, how it plays out uh, for the parents, for the kids, uh, for everybody involved. Uh, there are a lot of terms and common behaviors that are seen in that world. And uh, they pop up here, too. If, you, if you've if you read anything into the, again, the discourse around narcissistic parenting, uh, this show is a great place to... It's like textbook. It's, it's a good shooting range to try and pick the behaviors out as you're going but, through. Yeah, so a lot of those <laughs> things would be the roles that the children play or... Um... Like subconsciously. One example might be the golden child concept, wherein a narcissistic parent tends to identify one or a couple of children as being inherently better or um, above other children due to behaviors or attitudes or traits perceived or real, and creates a dynamic where one child uh, can do no wrong and other children are most often at fault for things that go wrong in the household. Another example we'll see sometimes is the fawn response, which is when, in an attempt to placate a narcissistic parent, a child will revert to behaviors that quickly diffuse or de-escalate the parent, even as they are unhealthy. Uh, the cuddle party is starting as I'm saying <laughs> the this, cuddle party's a and it's distracting. getting a little distracting. I will say, I did put this in my notes, I am very happy with this positive masculinity yes. because there's nothing wrong with hugging your dude friends, okay? Yeah. I don't... And if you want to make it weird, that's your own personal issue. Um, but yeah, fond response means that you uh, try to act super sweet and try to diffuse. Um, some people are going to completely just zone out and just not uh, pay attention to what's going on because they just physically can't. Um, some people are going to get angry. They're going to buck up to the parent. Some are going to suck up to the parent to try and win the love back. So here we are at Ethan and Olivia's house, and I think this is the first time we see them in the new season. Things have gotten difficult, is is how it comes across. The communication is, is struggling. There's a lot of gaps between what the two of them want, how they see the situation, and they desperately love each other, but there's also a lot of young emotion tied up in their ability to work on these things. The parts of the show that talk about Ethan and Olivia, it really demonstrates um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Ethan and Olivia have left physically their traumatic situation. They are not in fight or flight anymore. They're not actively being abused, so now they're able to focus on these um, higher level concepts. So now they're focusing on their relationship and they're focusing on their own individual um, life goals. It's really interesting and cool because since they're not under purity culture anymore, they have the opportunity to break up if they want. That does come up a lot in the season and it's just, um, I think it's really cool because it doesn't scare them. It's not the end all be all. They know that relationships can exist outside of this huge religious institution. What you see a lot of times with Ethan and Olivia here is also byproducts of the evangelical Christian de-emphasis on the self. Um, yeah. the, the consistent self-sacrifice, be sweet to everyone, put everyone's needs before your own as Christ did, that makes this type of inward introspection feel 
non-intuitive and I would expect maybe even um, a little bit guilt provoking just because yeah. you've been taught that focusing on yourself is bad and sinful and selfish. But in reality, that's exactly what these two need to do here. And I think Ethan is responding to that trauma by retreating into the hobbies and, and doing what he usually did yeah. back when he was lower on Maslow's hierarchy, uh, which was just um, ignore and deflect and avoid. Whereas Olivia is a little farther along in her deconstruction than he is. So she has become more comfortable focusing on herself. And I think that will play into some of the behaviors we see later and the actions that they take. Also, personality plays a big part, too. Yeah. So and she's like a very uh, up and at him, like productive type of person. So she's like, yeah, I want to go confront Kim and I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> you know, whereas um, Ethan, he's way more hesitant. Ethan, bless his heart. You just feel for him through this whole season. I feel like the way I described it was he's confronting the future he wants and the reality that he doesn't have the tools to build it. It's like watching someone try to unlock a door when they have the wrong key. It's very frustrating and it's so close and it replicates the the process as it should go, but not quite enough to be comfortable. And I think that's Ethan. He's, he's using what he has, but what he has doesn't work for where he is. Yeah. I know that's complicated, but essentially it's probably something that a lot of you have, have felt out there. Just not having the tools to make things the way you want them to be. For the record, I will say though, one of my favorite things about this season is watching, I would say, Ethan go get his tools as mm -hmm. the course of this season goes on. Uh, this is a very, very cool season for Ethan. Not only is deconstruction hard because of like um, the peer pressure that they're feeling, but you go through a grieving process. Like not only you know, I'm losing my friends and my family, but also like now I'm not going to heaven. One thing that really struck me about this, kind of going along with what you're saying, Jen, is in the last video that I did, the Marjorie Taylor Greene video, I ended with just a short message trying to reaffirm people of uh, why their deconstruction is important and why it's so incredible that they stick with it even when it gets really, really hard. And uh, I heard a lot of uh, people tell me that they really appreciated that, and I was I was just trying to find something positive in the video on. It meant every word that I said, but I didn't realize how important it would be to have someone on the outside of your deconstruction reaffirm you. And uh, I think in this situation, Ethan had to do that on his own. Yeah. And uh, I saw how hard that is by just seeing all of the kindness and all of the uh, sincere messages I got thanking me for a very easy little bit of reaffirmation that I gave. Um, I do want to reiterate, y'all are incredible and keep going because you're tough as nails and you're cool as hell. It's just very interesting to watch someone struggle through it by themselves because I do think, especially uh, as we see throughout this season, there are some times where Ethan is very, very alone. Yeah. And uh, more than you might even expect. Bless his heart, he gets there. He got there by himself. I, I don't oftentimes like to attribute uh, positive developments to someone just being a remarkable person, but it's Ethan is in some ways just a remarkable person. Mariah's boyfriend, we kept calling him Chad in the last episode <laughs> I for obvious his reasons. I forgot the last time. Um, he's trying to get a uh, pinky promise ring sized for Mariah because she has such tiny little skinny fingers. So he's trying to uh, figure out the ring size without being obvious, even though he's being pretty obvious, <laughs> but it's fine. God bless him. Lydia thinks everything is fine because her most of her family's back together. And I mean, she's still a teenager. Think about this entire season. She's still a kid. And um, this would be really hard, especially with the way that her mom acts like a complete and total jackass. And the, the conflict with Ethan and Olivia is that Olivia wants to move to Tampa, Florida, which is um, a couple hours away from where they live. And I completely understand that. I grew up in a very small town and I wanted to get the hell out of there as soon as I possibly could. And also, you know, they live a block from the uh, abusive family that she's trying to escape. So I understand. Ethan, probably scared. This is all he's ever known. So here we are at their clever ring sizing ceremony attempt that uh, ended up working out really well. So here we are again with Lydia in her prayer closet. Um, that's always wonderful. Um, you're going to see throughout the season that Kim is really trying hard to rebrand the family and uh, get you to buy into this new version of the plaits. Mm -hmm. One example of that would be um, Lydia is wearing pants now. Of course, Kim had been wearing pants in the previous seasons, but... 
she's probably a uh, okay for me, not for thee type person. Once again, we're seeing this very intimate uh, prayer in the prayer closet, and I just feel so uncomfortable when I watch other people pray, not because I'm like offended by it, which is what I'm sure um, some fundies would have you believe, but just because I feel like it's very intimate. Like, you're literally talking to God. Why am I watching it in 4K? And then here we are again with Naked Ass Micah. Push it to the limit. Limit! Yeah, Micah is, um, I, I think the phrase would be, uh, too hot to care. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I mean he's that. like, hard to care about your abuse, Mom, when I'm fucking looking <laughs> like this. I got three modeling gigs lined up. All the chicks want me. All the dudes want to be me. And they all wrestle with me shirtless. He Mariah and Lydia were robbed of a sweet little teen girl sister moment. And it's the same thing here. Big brother helping little sis learn cars while she gets her first job. That should be a yeah. sweet, wonderful memory. Not this awkward clusterfuck that Kim turned it into. And again, I'm... Pointing all my blame at one person. One person makes this awkward. They both know it. You know it. I know it. She knows it. We all know it. Because that's the thing. We keep seeing every nice little fun childhood memory that could be had by these kids is robbed because of Kim's overbearing parenting and intrusion. A lot of that is because narcissists don't really like kids. They want teeny tiny little adults they can parade in front of others to show how great they are at building teeny tiny little yeah. adults. When they're kids, they expect them to be fully fledged adults and handle um, adult level um, problems and things like that. But then when they're adults, they treat them like they're children. And as we might have expected, here is uh, Lydia giving her mother her full debrief of the meeting with Ethan as he knew that she was going to. Um, so Ethan was smart and it's tragic, but he played his hand exactly as he needed to. Lydia has been texting a boy, um, apparently a hundred texts a day, according to Kim. And she would know because she is obsessed with the situation. Um, fan behavior, honestly. Um, and so Lydia's having a normal, I don't even think it was flirtatious. Probably it was probably just, what's your favorite Bible verse type questions. And Kim's getting all concerned and she's trying to act like, see, I'm a good parent and I just want to protect my daughter's feelings. I find this kind of ironic because anyone who's ever worked with teenagers knows that when they say I'm talking to someone, that can mean a whole hell of a lot of different things. And the irony here is I think that poor Lydia is just talking to this boy. Kim says you can't get to know a boy through text. Okay, then invite him over. You know, the hardest is deceitful above all things slash you're a horny teen and this is purity culture so obviously if you're alone with a boy you're going to get pregnant so it's like what do you want kim because most most of these fundamentalist families that i see texting and talking on the phone and writing letters and emails is always preferred over physical contact in these courtship situations you'd think kim would be very happy that she's texting a boy. Lydia, you know you can't get to know a boy through texting. The only way to get to know a boy is through a carefully constructed cotillion that I will set up in the backyard. Lydia's mad at herself for, for accidentally having an emotional bond with a boy that she's texting, and that's why purity culture is so horrible, because this girl is racked with guilt, and she probably has all kinds of other um, traumas, so let's just say that um, she's up at night crying and praying. Crying, she shaking, throwing up right now because she ha it feels guilt about having a crush on a boy over text. It, her mind is so warped from this culture of sexual shame that she can't even do something as innocent as text a boy. Fellas, is it sinful to enjoy texting a boy? Yeah, I just wanted to show you, like, it sounds funny and stupid, but, like, this is, it's very serious. And once again, we get to see Ethan and Olivia desperately trying to communicate when neither one knows the quite the right words to say, even though I honestly think they both know deep down they want the same thing. Mm -hmm. Kim dropped Lydia off at Ethan and Olivia's house, and of course she had to be weird about it, and they were like, oh, you can come to the driveway, and she was like, why can't I just come to the front door? But now it's super awkward. Kim believes that being able to violate boundaries is confirmation that she's a good parent because if she were a good parent her kids wouldn't have boundaries with her in reality it's quite the opposite as we all know but uh this season is like every other season of welcome to Plathville, a mini episodes long temper tantrum from kim in this scene olivia and mariah are talking about birth control methods and olivia is super comfortable to talk about it um but i definitely sense hesitation in mariah probably because um 
she just left the main house and she's probably still coming down from that purity culture. But yeah, they didn't have any sex ed or anything like that in their culture. Long story short, uh, Mariah basically is saying that uh, she's on birth control and you know that would be just like a normal conversation to secular people but this is a pretty big deal and part of me wonders if Mariah was scared to have this conversation on camera because it would get back to her mom not that her mom can do anything about it but it's still she's gonna always have that guilt and um, Kim's always gonna be a voice in her head because of all the uh core memories she formed with her I think that this scene is uh, one of the best to reveal the, the fundamental gap between our understanding of what we're seeing and the reality of the lives they live. Um, I just, I would say, none of us would want to have this conversation on camera. There's always a little bit of doubt in regards to what we're seeing and our interpretations of these people and their actions. Um, I try to remember that while we're watching the show because you feel like you get to know them very well in reality. Like, don't sleep with your boyfriend, don't. And then you think, like, like you see somebody fall asleep on the couch with somebody, like, they're just taking a nap, and you're like, oh, they're gonna get pregnant. Like, and as funny as that is, that's that's purity culture, and that's, that's reality. Um, Ethan spends a lot of time with himself, and it's very difficult to have a constructive healing journey sometimes when you're isolated and lonely. Ethan does a great job of it, to be fair, um, and he does build connections. He's talking to his boss here. I would like to see Ethan and Olivia both realize that we're not putting our values, our requirements, our whatever on them, that we are also giving them freedom to live their lives however they want, drink alcohol, get tattoos, do, I mean, whatever, whatever they want to do that's different than what we do. We're okay with that. You said Olivia was infested with dark spirits. So now you're okay with the dark spirit things because your kids backed you into a corner and you're hoping that by being okay with it, you don't have to apologize. Kim... That's, the, that's what it is. ...is blame-phobic. That is the way I would <laughs> phrase it. Kim, the entirety of this series, back to front, has been Kim Plath avoiding oh, they, blame. They wiped a few things back to front, that's for sure. But I think that this is so important to see because Kim is just so terrified of accepting responsibility for anything she's done or for any of the reasons that her kids would feel the way they do about her that it's kind of sad because, honestly, one legitimate apology would probably get her a lot of what she wants. Mm -hmm. And the introspection and personal growth and behavior that should follow a legitimate apology would get her everything else she wants. But she can't do it. She can't do it. This is a nice scene where they're doing a little family-wide scavenger hunt. Um, so Micah can get his birthday money and I decided to include this scene because if you, uh, were abused by your parents or you have any other, um, traumatic type of situation, it's important to remember that, yeah, there are good, happy memories associated with your upbringing and that's the same thing with Micah. Yeah, um, Kim was a absolute terror to him, but I'm sure they have fun memories. They were all in a band together and, and they probably had a lot of really good times, um, and he might be thinking about these fun times and then also be flooded with these horrible memories because they do exist together. But it's important to show that abusers are just regular people and that's how they get victims to abuse is they're nice to them um, sometimes. If you were abused by someone, your trauma is valid even if you have positive memories of your abuser mm -hmm. and you aren't required to give those up. If your abusive parent did something really cool for you, you're allowed to look back on that as a fond yes, memory. Yes, I like that. Yeah. You're allowed to look back on that and cherish that. And I know it's really hard because we sometimes think of, of overcoming these things as an all or nothing game, but it's not. Getting comfortable with those gray areas is a big part of deconstruction. Yeah, so this is the beginning of what we had kind of referenced earlier when I said that uh, Ethan was going to end up being even lonelier. Um, 
spoiler alert, Olivia is going to move out for a little while. They're never going to end their relationship, but they are going to take some time apart. Um, throughout, Physical separation. Throughout the show, you'll notice that they both respond to that in very, very different ways. Olivia finds healing and strength and comfort in other people. Uh, she spends a lot of time with her friends. Whereas Ethan, again, retreats into a very singular life, uh, up to and including literally just running off for three days with no one and telling no one. Yeah, see, Ethan is uh, going out to build something because his emotions have become too much. And, uh, bless his heart, he uses his coping skills a lot, even if you don't have many. Yeah, at least he's not doing drugs. The most important thing is to use them. The most important thing isn't to have a lot of coping skills you don't use. It's to have a couple that you do. I mean, we're just seeing here exactly what we talked about. This discussion of where to move is a central part of the whole season. And, um... The arc ends with them on the same page, which is really cool, especially considering how in their trial separation or whatever you want to call it, they had to take such different paths in order to figure out how to process their feelings and how to figure out what they actually wanted. So it's really nice that they ended up on the same page. And Mariah, bless her heart, she is falling all over the place and um, in a lot of pain, but she is very tenacious and um, loves to try new things. So <laughs> here she is, rollerblading. Mariah, don't let nobody stop her. If you need inspiration, also let's take a moment to admire the t-shirt she got Max here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, full scale, Facebook personalized. Awesome. <laughs> Love them. Yes. Ethan, Isaac, and Micah want to hang out and play golf. And Kim's being sketchy with how she wants to pick him up because, of course, she's got to make it weird. And it's just a very frustrating situation. On a cursory glance, I can understand how one would think that Ethan is also being unreasonable. He's not. He's absolutely not. The man has enforced boundary after boundary, and they've been trampled on. All he's doing is desperately hoping that one of his boundaries at some point is uh, respected. The only thing that I want to hear from her is sincere apology to not justify and excuse and explain why everything that she did, she did because she thought it was right. They put him in these really fucked up situations. And just for reference, for those who don't know, flying monkey is a term that's brought up in that narcissistic parenting discourse we talk about. It's the term used for... Um, People who report back to the narcissistic parent, often siblings, family, friends, uh, can be anyone. Or they're sent to go um, stir something up. Or collect information or cause trouble for the uh, dissenters. Sometimes, actually I'd say most of the time, they don't even know that they're doing it. Yeah. Because um, they're just trying to get love from their parent like everybody else, and it's just not fair that they're put into these situations. It's not the kid's fault. And the parent sees an area to exploit because the kid still wants to hang out with their siblings, which is perfectly normal. We're not calling anyone a flying monkey. We're saying that the flying monkey is in effect. This is the introduction to one of the main conflicts of the season. Um, Mariah wrote a song, and she's got a gig to play at, and um, she's telling... Kim, I don't want you at the gig because Olivia is the piano player. And of course, Kim, instead of being like, well, that sounds reasonable. You know, I did traumatize both of these people and I should uh, let Mariah have her day. She, all she cares about is, well, why can't I go? I want to be there for my daughter. I, I want to support her. And you're telling me I can't? <laughs> even though the most obvious way to support her would be to not show up. The most important thing you can do to support someone is to respect them and their wishes. In this scene, um, I almost shot the TV just like Elvis <laughs> because Max was pissing me off so bad. He was talking about how he doesn't like when Mariah shows her ass. Um, and she she doesn't stand by and, and, and let him talk to her like that. Nah, Mariah is uh, one of my favorite people on earth just because whenever you uh, call her out on something that isn't a problem or she doesn't need to do, she doubles down by doing the thing you don't like as hard as she possibly can. And I love that. I love that brand of pettiness. It's great. Um, you will not see her change her outfits at all throughout this entire show. Um, this boyfriend can, in fact, uh, fuck off. And um, sorry, bud, I love you, but you lost. <laughs> But if it's not their business, then why are you giving it to them? I'm not. This is mine. I'm not giving it to anybody. 
Yes, queen. But I do like that she said, it's my body. I'm not giving it to anybody. He also came from that uh, strict evangelical purity culture um, tradition because he's equating a woman just existing, just having a beautiful body to, I get to have that. That's mine, right? Why women show up with ass if can't have ass? If can't touch ass, why ass in vision? Just, yeah, just because it's fucking there. And even if she is doing it to show off her ass. Like, good for her. It shows how insecure he is and that he views um, her body as his own property because he's trying to dictate how somebody else dresses and it's not, it, that's not your body. You can't tell people what to do. He does come back and apologize later and it seems heartfelt. I think he's stuck in a limbo between who he used to be and who Mariah expects him to be. I yeah. think that he has a lot of growing to do. And I think, unfortunately, this scene was just, this was just the death rattle of his old life, of his old way of looking at the world and women's bodies, and Mariah ain't gonna put up with his bullshit no more. On the way to the gig, and Mariah didn't exactly say no that Kim couldn't come, which is kind of shitty. Um, but I also understand that she's terrified of her mother, so why would she? But luckily, Olivia's like, yeah, I know. She's probably going to come, so let's let's figure this out together. Mariah made the classic mistake of setting a boundary and expecting a narcissist to respect it. Yeah, how dare she? Yeah. Mariah, I feel that when I'm a bitch to you, you don't like it. Yeah. Mariah. And that makes me not want to be nice to you. Ethan and Olivia are um, making up, and uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, this is, these these two are the couple that keeps on giving. Every so often I get just a happy feely moment from them, and it's nice. And they um, they did decide to move to um, somewhere. They moved somewhere together. Uh, I think it was Mars. <laughs> Must be. <laughs> that's, where the, that's where they felt comfortable uh, knowing that Kim wouldn't be able to find them. Kim would definitely become an astronaut just to go bother um, yeah. Ethan and Olivia in space. Yeah, so what we're seeing here is the uh, moment where Mariah tries to set the boundary that Kim and Barry and the rest of the family aren't allowed at her concert due to her keyboard player, Olivia, not being comfortable with it. Always get a little disturbed by just how distressed Mariah looks during this conversation. All of that confidence and swagger we Ooh, see her gone. develop. Gone. The second she's in a corner, she turns back into the scared kid she was in the first two seasons. I do think it's really interesting um, that this conversation, little spoiler alert, but Barry is going to be respectful and avoid the concert. So I think that uh, at least this terrible conversation did have one positive outcome. And here Kim is being like, well, I'm not in the front row of the concert. We're just in the parking lot. Like, okay, so she can't even see you. So it's not really about her. It's about you once again. So it's about, it's about seeing exactly how far she can push the boundary. Yep. Because some people need to stick their finger in the light sockets over and over and over until they learn that electricity is real. And watch on Olivia and Mariah's faces the second, like the, the happiness just immediately drains from their faces the second that they know Kim is there. And that is a trauma response and it's very upsetting to see. And once again, I think we're in a situation where Ethan is made out to be the bad guy. Yes, he may have been a little intense by stalking the parking lot like a big game hunter, but at the same time, um, Kim hurt his wife and his little sister by doing this. And um, I think a lot of people in a situation like that would be very upset and would want to confront the person who was causing that pain. I think it's um, very clearly um, on purpose, this kind of behavior that Kim's doing here because she knows that she's forcing their hand. If she shows up and sits in the front row and, and does whatever, she knows that the kids are going to have to act civil and nice in order to keep everything um, happy and, you know, no problems here. Or she knows that... They, if they enforce their boundary, then they're going to look like the assholes. They're going to look crazy. You're you're yelling at your mom in public. You're causing a scene. It was set up that way. It was set up for failure. And it was it, it's to make the other person seem like they're the bad guy. Because, you know, if, if she would have just fucking stayed home, this wouldn't have been a problem. But the fact is that she showed up. So now, instead of enjoying their concert, now they have to worry about, well, is my mom going to make a scene? Is my 
brother gonna make a scene? Am I gonna make a scene? Or am I just gonna have a really shitty concert now? Now I'm gonna be shaking with nerves. I can't play. I don't even remember the fucking notes. Look at this. Look how fucking upset she is. Should be the happiest day of her fucking Should be life. The, yeah. Like, up to this if point. your child is responding like that to your presence, then you have fucked up. And you being there is not going to fix it. Yeah. It doesn't help. And the thing is, narcissistic parents will try this because a lot of times it works. If you do this over and over to kids who don't have this same skill set, sometimes it does feel easier for them to just relent and, and just, give in and give yeah. you what you want. Um... It's fucked up, but it does work. So anybody out there who's dealing with a narcissistic parent, hold those boundaries firm. It's tough. They don't make it easy, but you got to do it because you deserve those boundaries and you deserve your independence. Yep, and here we can see Ethan going on the prowl. He wants it known that he's not happy about this. And then they make Isaac get out of the car and deal with it. Yep. The grown woman makes her teenage son fight her battles for her. That's pathetic, Kim. If you're watching this, that was pathetic. She's trying to make it look like Ethan is the bad guy when this is clearly her fault. All you had to do was fucking stay home, Kim. And I know that I'm correct and that they're doing this on purpose. They're purposefully making Isaac um, be the bad guy because later on in the episode, the parents reward him for this behavior. And you can tell that Ethan sees Isaac being put in a position he has been put in in the past is how I feel about this. Ethan doesn't want to subject his brother to the treatment and the adultification and parentification that he went through. And so he is playing nicer with his brother, exactly like Kim knew that he would. So here we see now that uh, since Isaac was willing to fight one of Kim's battles for her, as is customary in the Plath household, he is rewarded with uh, time with his father. You are allotted one hour of quality dad time per year. Yes. For this quality time, we will enact the shaving ritual, <laughs> which I understand parents often show to their young, hairy-faced children. Yeah, he's definitely shaving all the time, isn't he? Look at him. Barry might be trying, but he's still a friggin' alien. Yeah, Barry is definitely not from this planet, and also this is super weird and awkward. <laughs> yeah. So here we see Barry forcing Isaac to pretend that he has hair on his face so that he can pretend to teach him how to shave. Hey, look at this scene. Remember this? Remember this? This isn't pretend. This is very real. July of 2020. I never noticed that uh, Barry looks like an angry chicken. Look at that. He does just, look like an angry chicken. We like to play pretend in this family. <laughs> so, Isaac, you've officially joined the man club. All right, I did it. My dad thought that was my first time shaving when it really was, and I had done it for a long time. And here it is, the, the, the big moment. Y'all about to see some, y'all about to see the most emotion you've ever seen on TV in your life. I'm crying. Look at her. Good for you. I love these two. I really love these two. And despite the flaws and the difficulties and the growth they still have to do, I want these two to stay together forever and ever. And I hope they get everything they want. And if y'all are watching this video, y'all some of the cutest, sweetest little fuckers I've ever seen. And you're awesome. Finally, um, we get kind of a dad's approval about the courtship, which was actually very smart on Lydia's part because um, in that culture, you ask the dad, not the mom. So it's really funny that she's like, well, mom doesn't want me to send 100 texts today, but let me ask dad. And um, I think he's going to come down and visit. Now, I don't know if that's going to be on next season or ever. Um, sounds really awkward to me. And in this scene, we once again see the uh, younger Plath children being held accountable for the things that the older Plath children did. Uh, Lydia, who has not done a single negative thing in her life, is now being told that because she accidentally enjoyed talking to a boy, <laughs> that she's having her cell phone taken away because, I don't know, sin or something. They don't even make it clear. Uh, the only thing they do make clear to Lydia is that nothing she ever does will be good enough. I just don't want Lydia to confuse God's will with my mom's will because growing up that was kind of how I saw it without even stopping to think that that's how I saw it you know my parents will being God's will so I will say that I think 
this whole segment was one of the big points where I felt like uh, we're seeing Ethan fully deconstruct his faith because he's asking some questions that I think a lot of the folks I've spoken to who've gone through deconstruction do. I don't know if he's going to end up leaving faith or, or going full atheist, but he's definitely challenging some of the things that he's been taught. And I think most interestingly is he is recognizing that the concept of God's will is really only ever reported to us by people and that those people will invariably put their own in reflection upon God's will. That's a big part of deconstruction, knowing that the word of God can be uh, perverted by man. As we see here, Mariah got a makeover. She has awesome purple hair. Um, I think I know a few things about that and I'm really happy for her. She's on her way to the new house. Her and Max and Ethan and Olivia are going to live in Tampa? Florida and they're all going to live together and she told the family that no they cannot come and visit. I think that this is just proof that Mariah is a Genonite and uh, she wanted to have hair we like her We do have the same YouTuber. birthday! Yeah. So Olivia takes the initiative to sew up some loose ends um, and get some closure with Mama Plath and I really appreciate what she did because she said I do not want to be treated like a criminal um, I'm here to say goodbye to these people and, you know, let's keep it civil. And I really um, was very proud of her. And Kim and Barry actually behaved quite well. I was very proud of them as well. I remember very distinctly while we were watching this, both of us did have to come to the agreement that they are allowed to watch through the window. And I do like how Ethan got out of the car um, and kind of made peace, and this was very sweet. I fully expected them to all, like, start playing the game again and be like, yeah, Yo, you're forgiven, it's fine, I love you, and all that. But they didn't. They held firm in their boundaries, and Kim asked for a hug, and Olivia said no, and I'm just... This, um, it's not the perfect rainbows and sunshine situation they wanted, but it's still really good. And honestly, in terms of the arc of the show, I think it's even better because I don't trust rainbows and sunshine from Kim whatsoever this was painful uncomfortable slightly awkward which when you're healing that's what it's going to feel like everybody drives off into the sunset and um we find out that micah took off to go live um in west hollywood so he is living his best life and um like we said uh he's too hot to care this was a decent season of plathville um hopefully it gets better uh, hopefully <laughs> um kim goes to fucking comprehensive uh licensed therapy <laughs> and micah becomes a part of the pit crew on rupaul's drag race and mariah becomes a hyper pop star that's oh and lydia starts her own line of modest jeans and gets a talk show that i think would be the best outcome for everyone either that or lydia goes full jex blackmore and uh oh joins the you know the satanic temple and campaigns against the president and you know starts sticking pig heads on spikes one more thing before i go um this piano i remember ethan listed it online he was selling it when they were moving and everybody was like oh my god he's divorcing olivia here's proof <laughs> and just tell you guys the most simplest solution is is usually the right one so yeah they were just moving and it was a heavy piano sometimes you just need to get rid of a piano. The emotions surrounding Welcome to Plathville for me are quite complex because I love, like I said, seeing this story played out. I think it's important to tell, and I think it's given us a lot of incredible moments, entertainment and otherwise. That being said, I always struggle a little bit with peering this closely into the lives of strangers. It's um, voyeurism. It's voyeurism, and uh, to everybody who's on the show, regardless of how I feel about you or how what feelings I've expressed about you, thank you for letting us go on this journey with you. Um, this is, yeah, it's very important and as, like, awful as it is that you guys all, you guys meaning the people in the show, the, the Plaths, had to go through all this, like, this is so, this has never been done before. Like, there aren't shows about deconstruction and family politics and conflict on this level where it's actually real. Like, most of the time the conflict is scripted and or exaggerated. This shit is fucking real and it is hard and it's scary and I'm messy. proud of everybody who stands up to their abusers who start living their most authentic life. So proud of you. And I think that you all are helping a lot of people. So please know that even when you're having tough days or you know that people saw things you maybe didn't want them to see and you're helping a lot of folks and uh, you're giving us all some great moments and uh, man, it's 
fun to see y'all learn new stuff. <laughs> I mean, even since the last um, Plath special that we did, um, so much has changed. I mean, I think that was the episode where we were joking about getting sponsors. And now here we are. And now this is, you know, this is your first full-time uh, Fundy Fridays gig. And <sighs> it's just been crazy. Like, the snark community, um, the events that have happened in the snark world in the past year, um, the events with the Plaths, like, just, it has just been... It has been a crazy, crazy time, and um, I am very excited to um, see what happens with the channel. And I, think that, I can't uh, believe there's been three seasons of the Plath since we've started the channel. <laughs> yeah, and I think that we've all seen in, in the era of the Duggars that we've all uh, been living in over this past year, um, and all of the things we've come to understand this about that This is the Duggars show. flop era right now. This is the Duggars flop era, and I think that it shows just how important a show like Welcome to Plathville is, because this isn't propaganda, this is, it is entertainment. And in some sure. ways, but... And in some ways, I suppose it is, but there's, there's a more realistic look at what it means to heal and what it yeah. means to... It's not a straight line. It's yeah. messy. It hurts. You're going to mess up. And even you can have all the fucking therapeutic tools in the world. And if your family isn't, isn't respecting your boundaries, it just, that could be so fucking frustrating. Like you're putting in the work and they're not. And yet you have to suffer. I can see why that would be very challenging. Yeah. I love you guys. Um, happy new year. We're Should Midwest. Do... Goodbye. We're again. Midwestern. Goodbye. It's, you. Yes. It's the nature of who we are. <laughs> it takes us 45 minutes to say goodbye because of all the corn. No, I the same just... reason why it takes 45 minutes to poop. Yeah. Um, the corn is the reason for all the problems and solutions in the Midwest. No. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, as of right now, we're filming this on <laughs> the, New Year's It's literally New Year's Day. We're filming this on New Year's Day. Uh, I am T minus two days from being a full time Fundy Fridays member and not having a steady paycheck for the first time since my freshman year of high school. So well, because of viewers like you because of paying viewers our like bills, you, he's allowed to be on the channel more. And I appreciate it, and uh, I'm not going to let y'all down. We got some cool stuff lined up. Oh, so, you have no idea. 2022 going to cool be wild. The cool shit I have... This I is heard, me beating you with cool things that are going to happen this I year. I heard y'all said you like uh, evangelical politicians. Let's have some fun. Number two, consensually smash that like and subscribe button. Turn on the bell if you want to know when I post. Um, leave a comment for the engagement. There is merch available, including... Um, my Love Language is Picnics, which is a reference to the second Plathville special that we did. And there's other merch, too, that's more popular. And uh, what else? We got social media and uh, read a book this year. Um, eat your greens and... Uh, drink some water. Drink drink that fucking water. Don't be like me. I'm over here drinking this fucking Plexus fucking Gatorade bullshit. I'm trying. I might have a soda later, but I drink my water today. Don't do it, okay? We, lo we love you. Be good. Uh, You're all royalty. Uh, we yeah, love you. Yeah. Bye. See, you don't understand, Mariah. You set the boundary, but I didn't want to follow it. So I couldn't just <laughs> follow it. I had to violate it because you said it, and I didn't like it. And I don't know why that's my problem. Mariah? Mariah? <laughs>